attracted me to the field was actually I had this unique opportunity to work with Gerd Binnig, who won together with Heine Rohrer the Nobel Prize for winning for inventing the STM, and um, so. I, w I couldn't really believe it because I was at a time when I was still a student and to me normal professors were like already semi-gods but Nobel laureates were like real gods and actually God called me and asked me if I would be interested to work with him and that was fantastic so he offered me three projects I could choose from one was to sequence DNA with a scanning tunneling microscope still not achieved the other one would have been to measure gravity waves, also it hasn't been achieved yet. And the third one was to see if the atom, atomic force microscope could get atomic resolution. And that was the one which most intrigued me. I'm not absolutely sure why, I mean maybe I did ask myself when I was a kid, like if I break a toy, why can't I just put the pieces together and they would stick again like they were before. Because the force microscope is very much related to that. In and it's making and breaking bonds when you do the imaging. So. Okay, so the question was, can we get atomic, true atomic resolution? Like, can we see defects? And so, during my PhD thesis, we built a low temperature vacuum force microscope and we could indeed get atomic resolution on an inert sample, on a potassium bromide sample. We could see the atoms, we could see the, the, the small distractions uh, or the small uh, perturbations we created by imaging the surface with too high a force. But it was an inert sample. So the question was actually, since uh, the scanning tunneling microscope really had its breakthrough, when it could achieve atomic resolution of the silicon, the reactive silicon surface, the question was, can we resolve silicon? And that was had to be postponed, so I actually finished my PhD and started to work in a company in California where we built atomic force microscopes. So my job was to design an atomic force microscope for vacuum and using this device within about two years I could actually resolve silicon 7x7 seven seven. and that was very exciting. Actually it was so exciting that I didn't know what to do next and I, I, I stopped doing physics at that time because I thought there's no more goal beyond that and I joined a management consulting firm because I didn't have the impression that our best microscope of the world was selling like it should and I wanted to find out why. So in that, but we had this very strange uh, finding that the only way we could get atomic resolution, I have a little, little toys here, my Lego blocks, the only way we could get atomic resolution was when this tip, the red Lego block is now the tip atom, the blue one is a silicon atom, when the tip would vibrate with a huge amplitude, so on the scale of these Lego blocks it would actually go probably about two meters up and down, and the question was why was it necessary? And while I was working in a, as a management consultant, I thought we need to dive into that problem and find a solution. And the solution was just that the cantilevers were too soft, so the springs which held those tip atoms were just not stiff enough. And uh, we also did a lot of benchmarking in my new practice as a management consulting. We were looking for the best. So I was asking who is the best in me measuring frequencies because our tip was vibrating and we were measuring the frequency. So it turned out there was this huge revolution in the watch industry in the 70s where quartz tuning forks were utilized. And I had an idea how to transform such a tuning fork into a force sensor. So I was working on this on weekends in my home. I had a sm small makeshift laboratory and I transformed the, the tuning fork of this watch to basically a force sensor. And uh, I was trying to find out how, whether that really works. So Christoph Gerber, uh, he, he, he got me in contact with Jochen Mannhardt who had been a staff member at IBM and had just been offered a chair at Oxford University. And he gave me a lot of freedom to pursue these new, uh, uh, this new research. And I could show within 
two years or so that actually, yes, this is much better than the soft silicon levels. I call this device the Q-Plus sensor. It's actually now very popular. It's, it's used by, I think, five companies now and lots of people around the globe. And we can get now incredible spatial resolution. So we are now, in terms of spatial resolution, better than the scanning tunneling microscope. We can do scanning tunneling microscopy and force microscopy at the same time, and we see much sharper details in the force microscope. So we can even see like the electron clouds in an atom. It's like mosquitoes in a swarming around, and that's how we see the, the, the electron clouds in the atom. And that's, to me, that's totally exciting. It's, it's really amazing. Now, of course, I don't make the mistake of, of like 20 years ago where I didn't have another goal lined up. So the question is, what is next? Where could we go? And I think one, one challenge we really have is if you again look at these Lego blocks and imagine these are atoms, what we can't do yet. We cannot really identify all the chemical species. We can, we can see differences, for instance, between copper and tungsten and, and tungsten and iron. But it would be nice to really be able to probe, to look at an atom, to identify its chemical identity, and also to move every atom at will around, basically to build Lego from single atoms. I think that's, so that's a goal which will take some time to be solved. It will keep me busy and that's totally exciting to me and keeps me going. And I love it. What was also interesting is that usually uh, when we came up with this new idea to use like 100 times stiffer force sensors, the, our peers in the force microscopy field were not so interested. But the people in scanning tunneling microscope were very interesting. And a couple of years ago, Joe Strosio, he's a scanning tunneling microscopist from uh, NIST in Gaithersburg, he uh, has a fantastic ultra-low temperature scanning tunneling microscope. It operates at, op at temperatures down to 10 millikelvin at magnetic fields up to 15 tesla. And I just don't, know, don't have that expertise. But he actually offered me to spend my sabbatical in his group. And the goal is now to transform his very, very cold scanning tunneling microscope into a combined scanning tunneling and atomic force microscope. And that's a great opportunity. Actually, I'm right on now. I'm working there, and it's just fantastic. Because, uh, of course, there's a lot of know-how in the ultra-low temperatures in the magnetic fields. So I can learn a lot. But of course, also Joe Storz, who can learn a lot from me and our force microscopy expertise.